Well, hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome uh, Pastor uh, Harry Williams, OG Rev, uh, to this call. Uh, it was just a few days ago uh, here at the church where Reverend Williams and myself um, uh, really spoke uh, to some tough issues uh, in honor of Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, Reverend Williams accepted an invitation to have a conversation about how uh, the Asian community and the black and brown community um, really experienced tension, especially during this time of COVID. But looking back at the history of this tension, really existing um, within the uh, paradigm of, of, of really a largely white European nation. And that opened up uh, really good words. And I don't know about you, Reverend Harry, but I've heard a lot of people commend us for mm -hmm. talking openly and honestly in the sanctuary, things that we're feeling in our hearts. And I believe we, yes. ended, we ended that conversation uh, with a commitment to walk with each other uh, more fully and more authentically um, as people coming from dis different communities, but really desiring um, shalom and peace and solidarity. Mm -hmm. And we just want to acknowledge that the same weekend that we offered that word together, uh, another massacre, a tragedy yes. happened in Buffalo. And first, let's talk about some of the facts about what we know, Reverend Williams. We know that 10 people yeah. were killed, three people were injured, and this was perpetrated uh, by a person who we come to find out uh, ascribes to a hateful ideology. Uh, what, what have you heard and what do you know, Reverend Williams, from what happened? Well, it was a, a, certainly a heinous act, but it was thoughtfully and meticulously and methodically planned out. The young suspect actually made a trip 200 miles to Buffalo, uh, perhaps a year before, to see the area, to see where he would do reconnaissance, to see where he could do the most damage. He, he didn't just pop up that day. He was there the day before to really look at the space where he would do he would commit those to an act even more violence. So it was not a, just a, a random act of violence. It was thought out. He wrote a school paper uh, that talked about uh, violence and, and uh, uh, murder-suicide. So, so it was not just a, something that he come about over the past few years that has given rise to this type of extremism. And uh, I think that as the faith community, we need to be the, uh, uh, the, the barometer, as some say, and not the thermometer. We need to be able to be salt and light and be able to speak to these difficult issues and to bring change, to bring the Holy Spirit into, outside of the church into the, the greater realm of society. Mm. Now, to be specific, uh, Reverend Williams, I did not read any of what he wrote. Um, but I heard references to this ideology called the replacement theory uh, that's within a broader white supremacist ideology. Um, wh what is the replacement theory, Reverend Williams? Well, from what I understand, it is the theory that people of color are, are replacing white people as the as the dominant culture, the dominant uh, force in not just America, but the entire world. And it's not a new, it's, it's had several different names, but it's not a new uh, philosophy as America um, does brown and uh, uh, at the, in the, uh, in, you know, the future has brought, the, these times that we live in today have brought some incredible changes in the world. When I was a young boy, there was no, there would be no thought that a man of color would ever be the president of the United States, that there would be black people on the Supreme Court, that the mayor, you know, the, the, the people, uh, 
that people who really have places of power and affluence and prominence in America would would look like me or would be, be uh, Latino or Asian. That was not a thought. It, America was a white nation. And, uh, and the saying was that if you were at the absolute top of your game, they would say that you were free, white, and 21. And so now you've come to a time in your life that at one point, and within the next years in America. And, uh, and, and so many people are unhappy about that. And they subscribe to the day when they want America to be what it once was, a white nation. They, they're not open to this, uh, to a multicultural society. And they see us, they, they see it not as a good thing, but as, as people of color actually replacing white people. And, and that's a call for war for many sectors. And not just extremist sectors. You see that in, uh, uh, in many different parts of, of American political life. It's, it's, more, it's said more politely, but it is what fuels a lot of the politics in America today. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and I know, uh, Reverend Williams, um, you've lived through um, a time in our country of much upheaval and change. Um, seeing the free speech, civil rights, Black power, uh, third world uh, movements. Um, and there's always been this um, kind of reaction to it, you know? And what I find disappointing is as much as some of these theories that uh, perhaps were more assumed uh, in previous times, um, we had thought had been marginalized or, or put sufficiently to the side that we wouldn't see them overtly again. But what I'm disappointed in is that many of um, uh, the principles are now, um, you can find them in, in, in mainstream media um, and with mainstream politicians of, of mainstream political parties. Um, the lack of rejecting outright and condemning uh, the ideology, of course, there's condemnation of the violence. Of course, there's a rejection of this as any kind of appropriate response but there isn't a rejection of the ideology. And my fear is that once there's, a, there's acceptance or comfortability talking about the themes, then of course that creates the ground for mentally disturbed or uh, really, really uh, fanatics to then act on it. And that's my fear, especially when leaders uh, of our nation won't condemn the ideology. Well, they they share the same sentiments as the gentleman who walked into that into that grocery store. Uh, but they they were not going to be as a, uh, they're not going to follow through with terroristic activity, and they as uh, but but verbally they 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 were in the, on the same plane. Uh, years ago, there was a rap group called Public Enemy. And they came up with an album called Fear of a Black Planet. Later on, there was a group called, uh, I forgot the name of the group, but they're from Texas. And they came up with an album uh, called Fear of a Brown Planet. Um, and and that's, that's, that's a definite, uh, definite problem. You know, one of the things that we found out about the apartheid struggle of South Africa <clears throat> that, that really brought in amazing change, you know, this, the country is still in struggle. But one of the things that really did bring some measure of healing was the fact that the people in power created something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And what that was, was they began, they, they brought together this collective that, that uh, had a uh, kind of a tribunal, which brought people who had committed heinous acts of racism and violence to accountability. There wasn't, there wasn't a, uh, a situation where people were in, incarcerated or in prison, but they had to really tell the story. And so instead of saying, we're gonna just move on from this and we're gonna have a kumbaya moment, they really allowed the truth of what had happened, the years of apartheid, the years of, of segregation, and, and that they let that evil have a voice. In America, <clears throat> we, we haven't done that. 
in America, we talk about reparations and what that would look like, a public apology for slavery. It hasn't really happened. It's happened in some, some areas for some, some groups in America. But as of overall, we haven't had that discussion. And, and I think it's caused some uh, a, a cancerous situation to, a, a, uh, to appear. And I think the end result of it is a lot of what you see when you look on the TV and you see this man who's done this heinous act. Now, um, you, uh, Reverend Williams, we don't want, uh, we know that uh, this heinous act is um, atypical. It's not, it's not something we can um, paint every person uh, who, who, who looks like and has the same skin color as this man. But there is a discussion in the air to your point about knowing and acknowledging history where people, um, without even knowing what it is, are condemning critical race theory as an attempt to paint all majority culture people as guilty um, of um, historical racism. Um, and that reaction against critical race theory seems to be coming out of this fear. Um, and yet when we look at critical race theory, its roots, it really is rooted in examining in the legal system how race played an issue and it absolutely played an issue. As an Asian person, uh, I can point to the many legal means by which Asian people were excluded, denied rights, um, and otherwise by the very government um, repressed. And so uh, this debate, uh, which is heated up, is a critique of this very examination of the history so that we can have a common base of understanding of what happened. And um, uh, this, this coming against critical race theory seems to, to be out of this fear this deep-seated fear of certain people losing their place in society, certain people um, being unfairly condemned, quote unquote. And I believe that that is preventing all of us from having a shared sense of what really happened. What is the truth? Because if we can't have a shared sense of history and what really happened, that absolutely we're we're, 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 we're condemned to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. And I think one of the issues that, has, that many people feel that if we talk about uh, critical race theory, if we talk about uh, white supremacy, that we're raising, a, a, we're raising the banner against people individually because they were born Caucasian, and uh, and that such is not the truth. Such is not the case. I went to see um, Tahanisi Coates. He wrote a book between called "Between the World and Me." And he, everybody's uh, that's a very powerful book that any I would encourage people to read. It's called "Between the World and Me." I saw him speak in San Francisco years ago, and he tried to explain the difference to prejudice and racism or race and racism. And so there's a, there's a uh, white people feel never committed an act of prejudice or racism. Uh, my people, I've never oppressed anybody. Uh, and even though I've benefited from the system of oppression. And, and uh, what he was saying was that there is a system that's baked into the DNA of America called racism, which was created when the country was first started and then when we first appeared here in 1619. And so the tentacles of that, that racism and that prejudice appear in healthcare, they appear in education, they appear, they appear in the political structure, they appear in, in every facet of America. And he, so he says that it's not the fact that I like you or you don't like me, it's, it has nothing to do with the skin color. It's this, it's this thing in the genetic body of the American politic that we have to talk about and we have to eradicate if we're going to really have peace in America. And so when we, when we have this conversation, it's, um, 
we have to we have to broaden it beyond the fact that uh, beyond the fact that of kind of quote unquote race, but racism, this evil that has perpetuated through so many years. So I think that's one of the places that we begin because if we just keep it at that one level, people will just be always defensive and they'll say, that's not me. And they won't want to talk about it. Um, but I think we have to bring it from that point of skin color to what the body, what's, what's festered into the American body politic, mm. which is racist. Mm. So maybe Reverend Williams, um, what I re remember very strongly, what I was convicted of, of what you said on Sunday, uh, when we asked the question, um, what can Asians and other people do? What can you ask Asian people and other people to, in the church to do in response to this tension that we have between communities? And you spent a lot of time talking about learning history, learning about the struggle of different peoples. You said that the Black community isn't a monolithic single community, but it is different communities. And you even pointed out that even Black folks have to learn more about the situation of different Black folks within their community. And so um, that's the, the, the commitment that I, representing the API community, want to encourage all of my API brothers and sisters to do is if there's any thing we could take away from the tragic events, it should heighten our awareness and desire to learn more, to dig deeper, to become more educated, to really understand the actual struggles of people um, of different races and the racism, almost every group that's immigrated to the United States uh, has experienced, including people now that we consider fully white. There's a history of the United States where different European groups came and they were stereotyped and they were repressed and they um, um, experienced different isms um, back then. And so it's just not black and brown and, and, and uh, Asian people. There's a history of any group that's come in to threaten the, whoever's been established um, by law or by violence or by fear, uh, they've been uh, repressed. Not even to mention our native brothers and sisters who were here in the first place, uh, Reverend Williams. That's my takeaway is to recommit ourselves to learning uh, what the history classes we took failed to teach us. Wow, that's a great place to begin. Certainly so. I mean, when you when you talk about the um, some of this, the issues that separate our communities, I there it's said that that an uh, that an African American man who lives in the flatlands will live on average less than uh, twenty years less. Than an Asian person who lives in the hills, mm. and that's because of the the access to healthcare. So those would be, when we talk about race and how it, it baked, it's not just about I don't like you or you don't like me. How it's baked into the American body politic and the, and how it's systemic. But when we talk about how faith intersects with that, um, it's not enough to to pray about it. We have to sit down at the table and say, you know, why do we live twenty years more than the black man? Who, who lives a mile away from us? Um, you, when you talk about some of the issues that about about crime and poverty in America, you have to look at because because you're called Oakland City Church, not just City Church. You're called Oakland City Church. As I said on Sunday, Oakland has a problem where they want to eliminate ten to twelve or consolidate ten to twelve of the schools in Oakland. These schools, except for two of them, they're all in Black and Latino communities. There is not access to STEM education that would allow, in many of these schools, that would allow these young people to graduate and go on to get jobs in Silicon Valley. This is not about prejudice, of, as we saw it years ago. It's racism that has, is going to keep these people in this bubble. So if we say that we really care, this is where we're going to begin to study. This is where we're going to begin to look at political issues 
is where we're going to show up at City Hall. Um, you folks probably won't see this in time, but tonight in, in Oakland, um, there's going to be a big rally, and I'm going to be one of the speakers at, at uh, Oscar Grant Plaza downtown. Um, so we have to become more, we have to become more politically astute and historically astute. And, we, you know, there was a great theologian who once said that you have to come to the table with the Bible in the one hand and the newspaper in the other. But in the day of the internet, we have access to all of these materials that show us how we can move, make concrete steps to healing the society. And I think this is the future of the church. This will make the church relevant and it'll open the doors for people outside to say that this isn't just uh, a religion for the, for the hereafter, but these folk care about us, their neighbors now. Mm. Well, I'm gonna try to get this out uh, as soon as possible to, to at least make people aware of what's happening tonight with the possibility that some actually might show out. Um, mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to circle back, uh, Reverend Williams, to why we started this call, which is lives were lost. And yeah. uh, I, quite frankly, I've been uh, um, reading about the, the people who were lost and a little bit about their background, uh, how quickly they, we found out about who they were. Many of them were middle to older age. Um, I know that most of them were African-American. And so many of them loved and served that community. So many of them went to church. So many of them volunteered. So many of them have these little stories of, about who they were. And so, yes, we lost um, some Americans, but um, these were special, special Americans, special people. And uh, if you might join me in honoring these folks, I, uh, we have their names at the bottom of the description here of this video, but I'm gonna just name them. And at the end, Reverend Williams, after I've named all of the victims, if we just might be open for the Holy Spirit leading us in prayer and everyone who's watching could join us in praying uh, for these victims and their families. Because at the end of the day, these families have been changed forever. Uh, you and me, Reverend Williams, we can stay and advocate and fight and push for change, but um, these folks are gone, and their families uh, have have experienced a tragic loss. So um, I'm going to name them one by one, and at the end of the list, Reverend Harry, um, I will begin a prayer. And if you could close this, brother, that would be a blessing. Absolutely. The friends, uh, the people who are lost to this tragedy. Roberta Drewy of Buffalo, New York, age 32. Margus Morrison of Buffalo, New York, age 52. Andre McNeil of Auburn, New York, age 53. Aaron Salter of Lockport, New York, age 55. Geraldine Talley, of Buffalo, New York, age 62. Celestine Cheney of Buffalo, New York, age 65. Hayward Patterson of Buffalo, New York, age 67. Catherine Massey of Buffalo, New York, age 72. Pearl Young of Buffalo, New York, age 77. Ruth Whitfield of Buffalo, New York, age 86. And these next three who weren't killed, but we pray for their speedy recovery. Zaire Goodman, Jennifer Warrington, and Christopher Braden. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift up these souls to you and we're thankful that they are suffering no longer, but our heart aches for how they died and our heart breaks for the families that remain to mourn them. And so we ask that you would send 
the city of Buffalo and all these families, send them your Holy Spirit to comfort them, um, to heal them, to stand with them. And we ask that out of this, however you're going to move in people's hearts, may you move powerfully in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Eternal God, we come to you to this time in a time of struggle in America. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you. And we thank you for your mercy, God, because even as there are tears being shed all over this nation, maybe all over this world, you are with us. You are with us in, your, in our grief and our sorrow. No, God, these are the times that challenge your church to be more than, uh, than, than folk who come and sing some songs on a Sunday morning, but to really be the salt and the light and the purveyors of this amazing love that you told us to carry out into the world. God, heighten our awareness of these issues and deepen our compassion. God, let us be you. Let us reflect you and be you and be filled with the Holy Spirit so that others may see it and understand this love that you've come to proclaim to us. And God, we pray that you would help us to heal the, the, this division in America and to speak against it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you, all of you who are watching us, for joining us for this conversation. Bye-bye now.